Falco, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, for the record, my name is Falco Schilling, and I'm the advocacy director for the ACLU of Vermont, and I'm um, happy to be coming for you, for you today to talk about uh, H-145, the use of force law. Um, I, I know that every witness on this bill so far said I, they think their testimony is going to be brief, and that hasn't really played out. Um, so I might be continuing that trend. We don't have a whole lot to add on the bill at this point in time. Um, we are fine with the bill as it passed out of the House and are not looking for any language changes at this point to the bill itself. Um, spent a considerable amount of time working through this um, on the House side. Um, in relation to the requests from law enforcement for language changes, um, we are not supportive of those proposals, mostly because we think that they are unnecessary um, and that they are already covered within the existing language of the bill and do think that they could have unintended consequences that might end up weakening the standards. Um, I'm happy to talk about that more, but in short, um, we, are, we are asking that the committee not uh, make those additions to language, but also be open to seeing any new proposed language. Uh, I know there's been some discussed in the committee this morning um, as possible language changes, but we'd be happy to weigh in on those proposals. Um, and in relation to some of the other issues that have been brought up by the committee this morning uh, regarding the use of uh, chokeholds and the training around chokeholds, we would concur with what you heard from the commissioner about uh, the belief that that training is unnecessary um, and could be, you know, I think it would be sending even more of a mixed message to actually be training on a, a prohibited restraint or a chokehold, um, especially when they are gonna be able to recognize that restraint and understand what it is. Um, so we would not propose changing that language to allow for training. And then finally, I, I also want to um, say that we'd be interested in some of the, the discussion that was brought up at the beginning of this meeting in looking at the scope of the applicability of this statute and what government workers this applies to. And if there's an interest in expanding that scope, um, we'd be interested in that discussion. Uh, so those are just kind of my high level comments, but I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, folks have on the bill at this time. Yeah. Oh, well, I want to be clear about that last point you made. Um, my concern is that um, workers at the Department of Corrections, guards, for example, would be under a different standard um, where they're not allowed to use any restraint for any excuse. Um, we already know that several uh, staff members at DCF may be charged with um, criminal offenses uh, arising out of some restraints at Woodside. There was an investigation ongoing about that, I don't know the results of that. And then we have DMH that sometimes finds it necessary to restrain people. And I just don't want to have two standards of restraint, one for police that's looser I might use that term, than what uh, somebody at DOC, particularly some of the people who, let's face it, are in custody of the Department of Corrections are very dangerous. And their lives may be at stake. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think it's important that we recognize it's not just law enforcement. Yeah, and one thing I'd like to speak to about the, the chokehold, because this has been a discussion as this bill has evolved, is what is this bill doing? Is it making it easier for law enforcement to use a chokehold? Um, and I've seen that as, as one of the criticisms of this bill. And as we, as we read it, I, I don't believe that this is actually making it easier for law enforcement to use chokeholds as a prohibited restraint. I think this is clarifying what was existing in the law before, specifically that if someone is in a life or death situation, and they're you know, having to grapple for their life, um, that it would be acceptable for them to use that type of maneuver in that situation where they might otherwise be justified to use a firearm or something like that. Um, but that was a little unclear in how the statute was written last year. Um, it mm -hmm. some cross references, and this is a way to make that more explicit and something that we, would, we, we understand that you know, law enforcement officers have the right to defend their own lives. Um, in situations where, where deadly force is justified. So um, we don't see this as, as making it easier for law enforcement to use chokeholds, but um, do you think that this is a clarification? Could I ask Falco a question? Yes, you may. But, Senator so, White. Thank you, thank you, Senator Sears. So Falco, the, um, 
comments by Julio Thompson about the um, um, kind of unconditional and without exception, um, uh, you know, the language about um, with ad, leaving out without hindsight. I mean, he had two uh, comments on both of those. And by at putting in the two standards from Graham and leaving out the third, are we setting a new standard here by leaving out that without the benefit of hindsight, since that is also um, in the Graham decision? So I, I would say that this is going above and beyond Graham in the ways that we heard. Um, but I would also say that if you look at the language in um, B sub one, it refers to the totality of the circumstances mm -hmm. uh, in that, and which is uh, in the uh, you know sub six right above that, which takes into account the fact that the law enforcement officer, um, it's the, the conduct and decisions of the law enforcement officer leading up to the use of force and all facts known to the law enforcement officer at the time. So to me, what that says is that that takes into account the idea that there cannot be hindsight. There's not information coming in after the fact. My concern with adding without the benefit of hindsight into sub one mm -hmm. is after the totality of the circumstances that that could be viewed as trying to limit the inquiry of the court into the moments superseding the use of force and limiting the inquiry into the events that might have led up to that use of force. Because one of the big things that folks talked about on the House side and one of the impetus behind this bill is wanting to make sure that the totality of circumstances is taken into account. If there's actions that unnecessarily escalate a situation to the point where force might become necessary, that that be taken into account when considering whether that force was in fact necessary. Um, so, I understand that the, the proposal that's being put forward is, you know, a belt and suspenders approach, but mm -hmm. is unnecessary and could have unintended consequences. Uh, and so that's why we are not supportive of that addition. Thank you. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> if we look at section four, that's another area that it seems to us needs further clarification particularly in burglary and robbery, uh, use of violent, forceful or violent suppression of force and oh. murder. This is on page, uh, my version of section four, 2305. 13 two, on our page, ours. Yeah, seven on, I, I've got two copies, one the as past the house and one the with the Zoros. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, do you, was there any? Did you have any discussion about that particular section? Uh, I didn't. I mean, we haven't. That was not actually an issue that came up in depth in the house in terms of that those particular uh, robbery and burglary concerns. But I do think that was a good catch by the committee and something that's worth looking at if we're amending the justifiable homicide statute. Um, it makes sense to amend it to make sure that if people are using deadly force that is necessary and proportional in the same way um, that it is throughout the rest of the statute. Um, so I, I would, I would, you know, I think it's worth looking at the specifics of those crimes, how they are laid out in statute, what the elements are. Um, you know, I think more my understanding, some of these elements would be from the common law, not specific <laughs> statute, but I think you heard that there might be good reasons to maybe be more specific there, include some offenses and exclude others. So if that's an inquiry the committee wants to go into, happy to be part of that, but could, that was a, I think that was a good catch by the committee. Thank you. Anything further? No, that's, I think all we have to add at this point in time, but happy to be there as part of the discussion and, and chime in if there's any proposed language changes the committee is considering in the future. Okay, great. I see that James Pepper has joined us, so I'm going to ask James and John Campbell to join us. James, congratulations on your new. Um, well, yes, it, it a depends on. Yet. He doesn't um, have. It depends on Senate confirmation, obviously. Um, so you guys could always do me a favor and um, maybe not confirm him, but I think you'd be hard pressed not to. Uh, so let's just say that. It doesn't make any difference if we confirm or not. He would still serve. That's our confirmation process. 
Don't tempt us, John, because we already know if he's gone, we have to deal directly with you. <laughs> Come on, Joe, please, uh, Senator. Jeez. Actually, uh, <clears throat> thanks for dropping by. Um, you are on the agenda, but um, when actually are you leaving or have you already left? I, I am working on a transition with John uh, and uh, waiting uh, on Senate confirmation. And um, I assume that that process, just given the time frames, will happen relatively quickly. I'm, I'm hopeful and uh, just really excited about it. And I am very thankful to this committee uh, in particular for all the work you've done over close to a decade on the cannabis issue and making um, it more equitable and making and working on expungement and all the related issues that are going to be a huge benefit for Vermont as we you know, walk into this uh, new world. Um, so it's been just a real honor to be able to come before the, to work with you and come before the committee. And I, I just can't thank you enough for, you know, helping me, uh, you know, helping me along the way. So thank well, you very much. Thank you. Um, your work, both as a member of the Shumlin administration on, on this issue is, uh, well, it's a well-deserved appointment in my opinion. I'm not sure what committee it goes to. Shouldn't go to government ops, should come to judiciary actually. So you're dealing with everything else. But government ops will probably steal your- steal We your probably will. I don't know why, but, um, but I do want, I want to thank you for working with us on so many issues. Um, and I particularly want to thank you for the work on um, raise the age um, and dealing with young adults in the, in the criminal justice system here. Um, you really did a terrific job for us there. And, and uh, your work on the Sentencing Commission and other areas will be greatly missed. Well, you, you've shown real leadership uh, on those issues and I'm glad that I could be a part of it in any small way, honestly. Thank you. But I will, I, I will turn things over to you, the capable hands of John Campbell, who, you know, is my mentor and my real friend and family member, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. And uh, again, congratulations. I don't know if any members of the committee have any more comments for James Tupper before we say goodbye on this wall. I'm sure we'll see him in some cases. Do yeah, well. we'll, be, we'll be talking to you. Great. I'm sure we will. I mean, for years you've been there. We're not going to let just let you go <laughs> off into the cannabis world. <laughs> off into the cannabis world. Mr. Chair, can I say say so, something? You yeah, know, please. People, most people don't realize um, all of the work that Pepper has done. Not you know, not just for actually for the department, but he also volunteered, as you mentioned, on the sentencing commission. That was not was not a an appointment. He did that voluntarily. And he's he's uh, gone with the racial disparities group. He's done incredible work with them. And those were all evening meetings. Um, Pepper, uh, he didn't know, uh, there's no such thing as an eight hour day in his day. Um, you know, he he's working constantly. Um, he was, it is my right hand, right arm. Um, and I'll tell you, I don't know, he will not be easily replaced at all. And um, I just think that the state is, is absolutely fortunate to have someone of his caliber um, and his integrity and uh, honesty, compassion uh, to lead um, this new board. Um, I, I just think we as a state are really fortunate. So I'm going to miss him. And he was, he was a son to me. So um, hopefully he'll be close by in his office. Good. Thank you, John. Pepper, and thank Pepper you for everything. You are going to be very, very busy for a little while here. So um, just give those little boys a yeah. big hug. I will. Thank you all. Thank you. Right. All right. The next issue, uh, the next witness is John Campbell um, on the uh, H-145 use of calls. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, John Campbell, uh, Executive Director of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And as I, as you've already pointed out, I'm, I'm filling in for Pepper because uh, we have decided that it, it probably would not be um, uh, 
right to have him uh, continue to testify uh, on behalf of the state's attorneys. We just don't want anyone you know, thinking that there's an appearance of impropriety or, or him to be subject to any uh, uh, question of bias or, um, uh, in any other cases. So, so we felt that be, it would be uh, probably more prudent for, for me to jump back into this role. Um, and I apologize for not being here a little earlier. I have, uh, as you know, I'm also um, am part of the uh, team that is prosecuting a uh, gentleman, Mr. Forte, who is a Bennington County case uh, and uh, uh, currently in hearings in Bennington County. And uh, I was able to slip away for right now. Oh, all over the front page of the Bennington banner this morning. Was it? Okay. So you're familiar yes, it with is. The, the case. Four guys in bed and you're trying to prosecute. I'm not going to make comments on that. But anyway, uh, the, so I, I'm not exactly, I hope I'm not going to go over what other people have. In fact, um, it's going to be fairly brief. I know there were two, uh, two uh, specific uh, parts of this that were in question. One um, had to deal with um, the, the standard. Uh, and I believe law enforcement community uh, felt it was necessary to, to add um, a language uh, regarding um, uh, the uh, look back on this and, and uh, hindsight. And um, here's, here's the way we feel, at least the way I feel. It, this this is basically deals with what's called the Graham standard. I, I don't know if any other witnesses have, have discussed that with y'all. Julio did. Oh, did. Okay, good. So currently we have a standard that uh, we call the Graham standard that is followed. Um, this legislation, I, I think if you look at it just as uh, in a vacuum, you'd say, it really, you don't need that extra language. It's not, it's not really doing anything it's, that's not already said. However, um, what concerns me is uh, because we've added or you all are cont contemplating to add language to this um, section, uh, that being the, the two um, parts of necessity and proportionality, that it could be argued, I think, that, that you're setting up a new standard uh, to be viewed. And I think the Graham standard is one that's been recognized around the country. Um, and it's not just dealing with, with use of force issues, but also dealing with search and seizure searches and, uh, and other aspects of the law. So if you go ahead and add uh, new elements, then I think that uh, a defense counsel or, or a court could look and say that you're establishing a new standard and therefore um, hindsight uh, you know, may uh, creep in. So. Uh, I, I would not caution, but I, I, prob I would suggest and urge the committee to uh, look uh, closely at adding uh, some type of language, whether it be um, language that law enforcement provided, which I don't have in front of me, or something uh, akin, but just to establish the fact that, you know, we are still sticking with the Graham standard, uh, even though you have expanded um, the, the two areas. Um, that's that one. The other, the other issue, I believe, uh, had to do with uh, the feasibility issue of knowledge uh, from, from, of a law enforcement officer of um, uh, certain um, matters, whether it be uh, whether a defendant or a sub, excuse me, a subject has um, mental health issues or physical health issues. To me, it seems more on a um, on a civil side that I'd be concerned about that. And uh, I do know that uh, currently. Uh, municipalities around the country are having uh, you know, problems with insurance coverage, uh, specifically for what's happening. And, and uh, in many cases, rightfully so, uh, there are some people that, that should not be police officers. And I've already you know, testified to that uh, here before. Um, however, it is putting, um, I think that it is putting a, a large burden on some of the cities and towns. I, so I, I think I would urge you maybe to talk to somebody on the civil side at the AG's office and ask them, whether um, the you know, adding feasibility language would improve or help uh, clarify this um, this matter, because you have actions that I think could be taken under 1983 and uh, federal um, civil rights actions, and um, I think it's it's probably not probably it is really important to be as clear as possible as to what you um, believe that or that the law enforcement officer, what obligations he has and whether he has the capability of actually understanding, you know, the full extent of things such as, uh, you know, different mental health conditions, different uh, medical conditions. Uh, there's, a, there's a myriad of issues that, you, you know, if you say mental health, say physical uh, or, or medical, what does that mean? Does it mean that they have to know uh, what all the, how all of these conditions manifest themselves? Um, 
or what kind of um, uh, issues might come up uh, that would put the subject in more uh, danger if he's, uh, if he's touched or, uh, or she's apprehended in certain ways. So I think it would be, um, uh, I think it would be prudent to have someone maybe from the uh, AG Civil Division uh, take a look at that as well. Right. Good. Um, Bryn, could you get us a copy of the, the posting in the, the Graham decision? Yep. So we can fully understand it. Or try to understand it, I shouldn't say we would. Um, it's kind of... Um, <clears throat> seems to keep coming up. Other questions for John Campbell? Okay, I'll go back to Bennington. Uh, drive carefully. Thanks. Are you physically uh, no. going to Bennington? No, we're 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 in um, actually my office is in here in Montpelier. Being we have two of our former Supreme Court justices who are also on this team. Uh, they're in each one room, and then uh, myself and and uh, Linda Perry. Actually. It's, it's actually a fascinating case. It's a child sexual abuse charge from 30 years ago where the defendant is claiming that he's too ill to be able to stand trial. And um, the, the state is, um, the victim is now in her 40s. Um, so, but they're still, um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, John, did you say you're working with Linda Purdy? Yes. Yes. Say, say hello for me. I don't think I've seen her since we had a murder case against each other many years back. She's an, an incredible attorney, an incredible person. I, I, I through this whole um, time period, you know, I've gotten very, I've gotten to know Linda very well, and I, I, I consider her not only a, a colleague but a friend now, and uh, I'm just so impressed with her, her. Um, her legal abilities and her compassion as a, as a, just as a human being. So she's been a good folks. I don't think I've seen her since she and Suzanne Young were tag teaming against me in a murder <laughs> case a number of years ago. So say hello. Joe, I don't even want to ask you what the verdict might have been, but I, I have a feeling I know. <laughs> so he got I a will. good deal. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you all, all again. And, and also thank, thank you. you. He did for Pepper because Pepper again I don't think he's on but you know he really did grow so much in the last uh, three years since he's left um, you know the administration and um, he's done so much for our department and for the state itself so uh, you guys were a big part of that and he considers each one of you a, a close friend and and um, I told him he can learn from each one of you individually and collectively so hopefully we'll be able to find somebody Otherwise, I won't even be not just kidding. Our next witness is Sean Burke, Chief South Burlington Police Department, and the head of the Vermont, I, I shouldn't say, I, know, I don't know if he's the head of it, but he's representing the Vermont Association of Chiefs. Chief, Thanks. welcome. Thank you so much. I, I thought I was going to get a uh, battlefield promotion there. So uh, again, just to recognize this, Sean Burke, I have the privilege of serving as the police chief in the city of South Burlington, and I am uh, simply the representative of Vermont Chiefs. Uh, I do promise to be brief like all the other witnesses. Um, <clears throat> I want to first thank all the committee work that went in on the House side of this bill. Um, how it's advanced this year has just simply added the clarity that we need in policing in order to operationalize this. Uh, and I've also had a, a personally a fond appreciation for the uh, all the partners that had um, time and space in order to give valuable input on this bill. I really feel like it's a, a good collaborative effort and uh, I'm happy where it's at when it came to your committee. We do uh, from the Vermont Chiefs uh, also support the commissioner's articulation of the uh, Graham standards that we'd like to see added to uh, this legislation. Um, we are anxious to uh, get the model policy finalized and uh, getting, getting that into training where we'll inevitably learn new lessons about this. We'll have good questions from the field. Um, but I think at this time, uh, I've never seen the Vermont police community so aligned and committed to carrying this work forward. 
and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, but I feel as though that what I intended to speak uh, on this morning, Commissioner Sherling and certainly uh, Julio Thompson uh, hit the, the, the fine points on. Great. Thank you. Questions for uh, Chief Burke? Chief, in the real world that you deal with, with on a daily basis, um, we have, um, <clears throat> you never know what you're going to confront when you or an officer of yours goes out into the field. Um, you've had shootings in South Burlington, you've had other incidents. Can you, um, how you have to react in a split second, I'm assuming. Is there time to view the, um, going back to that particular section where you might know the person? Can you kind of describe how you deal with something like that? Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's a whole host of uh, incidents that I can think of. And, you know, uh, Commissioner Sherling talked about the sword incident and he left out how cold it was that night. Um, and that's an extreme incident. You know, uh, there are instances where um, the officer may get out of his or her car and be immediately confronted with a situation that you just have to react to. Uh, and that's why without the benefit of hindsight is so critically important. There's a whole other um, scope of work where we do, we get a lot of information uh, front loaded to us from our dispatchers. We arrive, potentially a person's alone in their, in their apartment in a state of crisis. We're able to talk to neighbors, maybe the, you know, whoever manages the property and we're able to leverage resources. And I think, you know, cops on the street today, we're doing a much better job of training them. They're good critical thinkers and they use that time. And because through time and space, that's de-escalation. The escalation is not, you know, pixie dust that we pick off our belts and sprinkle. It's actually leveraging time and distance and then leveraging different resources that we can bring to bear on that, on those situations. So, you know, I think both need to coexist. And I think uh, that the police officers that work in our communities are excellent critical thinkers in using those moments. But often, not oftentimes, there are instances where uh, that time is just not afforded to us and we have to act in a split sec second. And that's why uh, without the benefit of hindsight is very critical language for ultimate clarity in the statute. Thank you. The questions for the chief? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here. Appreciate it too. Um, our next witness and final witness on today is Zachary, is it Hosen? I don't know. I don't want to mispronounce your name, Zachary. It is Hosen, yes, thanks, Senator. Hosen, Zachary, Staff Attorney with Disability Rights for Mom. Thank Zachary, you. welcome. Thank you, thanks for the invitation. To you know everybody here, I think this is your first time and I should have introduced uh, Keith Burke too. Um, I'm Dick Sears from Bennington County. Unfortunately, um, Senator, um, <clears throat> Baruth. Senator Baruth uh, is uh, out right on a uh, health care issue um, and we'll be back tomorrow. Uh, but Senator White, do you want to? I'm uh, Jeanette White from Wyndham County. No. Senator Benning from Caledonia County. And last but not least, Allison. Allison. <laughs> Alice Nitka, Windsor County, and some adjoining towns. Hi. Alice is also the clerk of the committee. So welcome to Senate Judiciary. Um, we're taking up H-145. Any comments from Disability Rights Vermont would be most appreciated. Thank you. And again, thank you for the invitation. Um, you know, probably all know disability rights role, but our role is generally to promote and advocate for people with disabilities in Vermont. Um, and the context of law enforcement, we do a lot of work on a variety of levels, including supporting victims in that process and collaborating with law enforcement to be supportive of victims in the whole criminal um, procedure process. Um, and we have also worked uh, along the past with uh, providing training and education for law enforcement and working on getting social workers and other alternatives um, 
to working with people with mental health in a number of crisis situations and even some um, potentially criminal situations where um, mental illness or other disabilities could be a factor. And so that's sort of the context we have here. Um, we do also work with individuals who have been um, uh, subjects of uses of force and um, you know, that goes, that ranges from sort of providing some general advice or, or legal counsel about what their rights may be to and on the occasion um, when we feel that their rights were violated, we do pursue uh, litigation if that's appropriate in some cases. So that's sort of the background that, that I can sort of bring to the table and um, happy to answer any questions, but from what I'd like to comment on this morning from what the conversation I've heard, um, I'd like to focus on the, the section B5 there about where it talks about disability. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think one thing uh, that really hasn't been discussed um, that I think should be is the focus seems to be on, um, you know, whether it's you know, feasible to in terms of considering uses of force. And I would like to sort of take a step back and look at what should be considered in de-escalating a situation and accommodating in a person's impairment. Um, and I think that should be the focus of, of the inquiry is, you know, does an officer know, or should a, I think it also should be, should a reasonable officer know that an individual has a, a disability or some other impairment that is impacting their, their judgment and their, their behavior? Um, and then if that is the case, how do you accommodate that? And how do you try to deescalate the situation considering that? Um, so I think having language to clarify that, and I think that's where the, the feasibility comes in is, is it, is it feasible, is it reasonable in the context to accommodate the individual's impairment um, in a way to avoid use of force altogether, or at least minimize it? Because um, we all hear the stories and, and the examples of individuals who are seriously injured and killed um, because their, their disability um, impacts their behavior and that is not appropriately just responded to and um, law enforcement uses, uses force that leads to, to serious harm. And so you know, really for everybody's benefit, we wanna to try to find ways to, to avoid that. Um, and I would note that you know, this, this bill is guiding the, the Department of Public Safety's um, drafting of their statewide um, policy. And in the last draft that I reviewed of that, there was uh, a comment in there about there's no different standard for interacting with people with disabilities. And that is, that is just not true because um, the Americans with Disabilities Act it clearly does apply and the Vermont Fair Housing Public Accommodations Act also does apply and creates this requirement that law enforcement provide reasonable accommodations to individuals with disabilities. Um, and so it's, also, it's not only not true, but it's concerning that that would be that would be in there. And, um, so I think if, you know, I would like to see language in this bill that strengthens and encourages um, that need to accommodate people with disabilities and uh, provide that guidance, you know, for the Department of Public Safety can provide greater clarity and guidance for officers and training. Um, so I think with that, I'll, I'll sort of um, wrap up <coughs> any questions that, that you all have. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand what you're looking for. Do you have some language in mind? Um, I didn't be five. Yeah, so, um, and I can submit something in writing um, later as well, but, you know, in the, the, at the beginning there where it says whether a law, when a law enforcement um, knows, I would, I would add language in there related to, um, you know, knows or reasonable officer should have known or has reason to suspect something along those lines. So it's not just what that particular officer knew at that particular time, but you know, again, reasonable officer standard, what was sort of reasonable for an officer to know and consider based on the facts and, and information available to that individual. Um, and so we're looking more at the, the behavior and the conduct and the history of the individual, that sort of thing, as opposed to whether they knew that a person had a particular condition. Um, and then I'm uh, just looking at the language. So at the end of, I don't have specific language now, but I can provide that. Yeah, um, we, yeah right. don't, I, need, I don't need it. Right, right. Minute, I, but I, if you could provide some. Yes, I can, but um, and just to sort of summarize, I think that the, 
That last sort of clause there about the officer shall take this information into account determining the amount of force appropriate. Um, I think there should be language in there, and again, I'll, I'll submit something um, later on, but something uh, encouraging um, de-escalation and uh, use of reasonable accommodations to avoid use of force, um, as well as considering that in sort of what a force is appropriate, but um, the focus really should be sort of before you get to that use of force, trying to avoid it. Um, and I think the, the current statute um, related to uh, tasers, which is 20 BSA 2367, um, that statute I think has good language in there about, about de-escalation. And so I think um, similar language could be borrowed and, and put here as well. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll submit something uh, later on in, in um, some red line comments. Thank you. Other questions for Zachary? Um, disability rights also um, represented um, people who were being held in Woodside. Um, and um, any idea on the use of force there? I mean, those cases were pretty high profile um, that went to court um, under Judge Cropper. I mean, several decisions of Judge Cropper that led, that helped to lead toward the closure of Woodside. Um, and there are still some DCF employees under investigation, um, last I knew, for um, the use of uh, improper restraints do our laws regarding restraint, are they similar throughout state government for employees of DCF, employees of mental health, employees of the department of care? Do you know my answer is? So, Senator, um, um, could you clarify the question a little bit? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Well, the use of restraints, we're you know, saying that the choke can be used when it's a case of life. So cold, you know, we define it, don't, can't train in it. But the use of restraints is not only allowed by corrections, I mean, by uh, police officers that are allowed to restrain people. We have Department of Children and Families do perform restraints, Department of Mental Health Workers and contractors perform restraints, and Department of Corrections personnel perform restraints. Do you know if they're uniform? That's what I'm asking. I, I don't believe they are. And uh, honestly, I don't believe they, they should be um, because it's a very different context. Uh, law enforcement is out there uh, you know, serving and protecting. If you're in a you know, psychiatric facility or another care facility, you're trying to you know, really only use force just to keep the person safe. And, and there's also less sort of danger inside a, a facility as opposed to out in the community. Um, so I, I would, I think they are very different standards, um, and I think that there's good reason for that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Bren, um, can we talk for a few minutes? Um, obviously, we got other witnesses scheduled tomorrow and probably at another date on this bill. Um, I'm curious. You know, we've, we've kind of identified five or six places that need further examination. So let's, but it looks like focus on um, B1, B5, um, I think most of the discussion you've had on the law enforcement use of force standards this morning has focused on B1 and B5, and also uh, necessarily the definition of totality of the circumstances. Um, so if you're giving me an opportunity to respond to the witness's yeah. testimony, yeah. I would be glad to. Yeah, that, that would be okay. helpful. Okay, so um, I just wanna remind the committee that B1 is the language that sets out the standard by which uh, a court will judge whether an officer's use of force is reasonable. 
and all the subdivisions that follow are gonna necessarily be qualified by that analysis. That's the Graham standard that's set out in B1. So I, and then the other thing I think the committee, I just wanna remind the committee is that B5, that language <clears throat> about law enforcement knowing that a subject's conduct is due to their impairment, that does not prescribe the use of force when an officer knows that a person is impaired. It only provides that law enforcement shall, if they know that the, uh, the subject's conduct is due to impairment, factor it into their decision about using force. So an officer's decision to use force against a person that they knew was impaired will be analyzed by, uh, by under B1. So the question will be, was there an alternative that was feasible to the use of force? That, necessar that language in B1 necessarily qualifies the language in B5. So that was the testimony that the House heard about um, in response to the commissioner's um, testimony about adding language about feasibility. And that's why they decided not to add the language there. I don't think that um, there, the fear that B5 will be read in a vacuum is justified. There, as this committee well knows, there's a cardinal rule of statutory construction, which is that the whole statute should be read holistically with the various parts being interpreted within their broader statutory conduct in a manner that furthers statutory purposes. That's a case, that's a US Supreme Court case from 1850. I don't think that a judge is going to look at the language in B5 in isolation and make a determination that an otherwise reasonable act of force was unreasonable because of B5 rather than the analysis that's set forth in B1. So having, the, having said that, if you want to include that language about feasibility in B5, of course you can do that, but I don't agree with some of the testimony that you've heard that that would be belt and suspenders language because there's another rule of statutory construction, which is that a statute should be construed so as to avoid rendering superfluous any statutory language. A statute has to be construed so that effect is given to every provision and no part will be inoperative or superfluous, void or insignificant. And that's a Supreme Court case from 2004. So um, that, that was the testimony that I gave to the House on the request to include that feasible language in, in B5, and I'm giving it to you here. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the benefit of hindsight language, um, my understanding is that the request is to put it, um, put that language in B1, mm -hmm. the language that sets out the standard by which a court is going to judge whether the officer's conduct was reasonable because that's really the Graham standard there. But I'd point out as other witnesses have done that that analysis is based on the totality of the circumstances. The totality of the circumstances is defined to mean all of the facts that were known to the law enforcement officer at the time. So as I testified to um, House Judiciary, I think that that encompasses um, only the facts that were present at the time of the interaction. So if you want to include additional language that provides um, that there, the court cannot use the benefit of hindsight, I think you need to add that language in the totality of the circumstances definition. Otherwise, all of the other places that totality of the circumstances appears in the standards may not be considered to, uh, to exclude any benefit of hindsight. If you're only gonna qualify that language in B1, then I think that you make the definition of totality of the circumstances confusing. So I think if you wanna add it, it would need to be in, in A6. <clears throat> but again, as I testified earlier, I don't think that it's um, necessary because I think the totality of the circumstances definition, which you worked on, quite a bit, if you, if you remember, that was one of the areas of the standards that got the most attention when you were working on Act 165. Um, I think that you worked hard to ensure that it didn't include the benefit of hindsight. Um, so, but if you wanna add it, that's where I would add it. Thank you. So then it would be for everything. It would apply throughout wherever totality of the circumstances is used throughout the standards. It would be clear that um, yeah. it does not include the benefit of hindsight. And B1 is the Graham standard. Correct. That is the that is the language that you can find. And I sent the committee the case 
um, the Graham versus uh, Connor case. And I also sent you a, a memo that I drafted last year that kind of de put, describes a little bit about of the Graham standard. Um, so that's the language there is in B1. Okay. What about um, section four, justifiable homicide, section four, two? Any thoughts there? Yeah, so I have been trying to listen with one ear and do a little research um, with <laughs> at the same time about this. And it does look like um, the, the way that our self-defense jury instruction works does not quite encompass um, everything that this justifiable homicide statute seems to put forth. Um, so I'd like to look into this a little bit more to, to see if this is, um, if the statute is even really um, in compliance with how the courts are currently undertaking a self-defense analysis. Thank you. Other questions for Bryn? So I, I, I have a, I'm not sure if yeah. this is a question or not, but- I have to go take care of a dog that's barking. I'll be right back. If you okay. could take over, Alice. Okay. Go ahead, Jeanette. So in B1, <coughs> I guess I'm confused about why what what I heard was that we use objectionably objectively reasonable and in the same situation. Those are two of the the phrases from Graham, and that the third phrase is specifically left out. And if that sets a standard that's different from Graham because we've specifically left it out there without benefit of hindsight and um oh i don't think that you have left it out is what i'm is what i'm saying because that you refer to the totality of the circumstances which specifically says that it's all facts known to the officer at the time so when you worked on that language initially last year you we were talking about the benefit of the hind of hindsight analysis that was a part of the graham uh decision and that's how you crafted that totality of the circumstances language with the understanding that you can't look back before, um, you know, you can't look back after, after the fact with all the information you have after the fact. And that's why you crafted that definition the way you did. So I understand that the words without the benefit of hindsight don't appear, but um, it's just my testimony that, we, that you talked about this during the course of act, um, working on Act 165. And, and that was that was the legislature's attempt to um, to codify without the benefit of hindsight. Okay, and then I do have another question about the um, B5, about the um, example that Julio gave about with the court asking, did you consider no, I didn't consider because I was being shot at and I didn't have time to consider. So without how that would play out here is um, the court is going to ask if you considered all of those alternatives and um, your failure to use feasible and reasonable alternatives is in a one B one, and then here we're saying that you have to have looked at all of those feasible and alternative um, actions before you before you act. And if you don't have time to do that, is the court going to take that into consideration that you didn't? You know, I was being shot at, and to be honest with you, I didn't think about the fact that the guy was having a, a mental breakdown or a diabetic um, coma because I was being shot at. Right. So the, so the, 
the committees, when you developed this language in Act 165, you were looking at some uh, federal court case law, including from the Second Circuit, that requires, there, there's already this requirement that exists in the Second Circuit and several other circuits that the use of force analysis be different when an officer is using force against a person that the officer knows or reasonably should know is suffering from an impairment. So that's why you added this language in B5, one of the reasons why you added it there. And what, and what I've, um, my testimony is that because B1 sets forth the standard that the court is going to use in determining whether any law enforcement use of force is reasonable. And that's where that feasible alternatives language is, that qualifier is, mm -hmm. that even in a circumstance where an officer uses force against a person that they knew was impaired, that use of force is still going to be analyzed using the reasonable, reasonable, reasonable and feasible alternative analysis. They're going to ask the question, was it feasible to use an alternative, even if the officer used force against a person who they knew was impaired and their conduct was due to that impairment? Yeah, I, I just, I get very confused about the, uh, how, how we do this and knowing that people have to make split second decisions um, is, uh, if everybody had time to to consider and to think about it and to say, oh yeah, I know that guy is having some kind of a mental breakdown or he's he just took some LSD um, tabs and so his I'm going to treat him differently. I'm going to, but people don't have time to react, and I I get very nervous that we're setting up situations where. Um, the, particularly in our current environment, that we will um, react in um, uh, knee-jerk reactions. That's all. I think that just as I mentioned earlier, I think that if you do want to add the, that feasible qualifier in B5, you, you may need to add it everywhere else where you want it to apply, because then that may be suggesting to a court that they're not to analyze everything through B1, even though that looks like the standard by which they should use, um, they, should, they should use for all law enforcement uh, use of force. You may need to add it elsewhere as well. Will, I see, yeah. Did you want to comment? Yeah, yeah. Just, a, just a couple of things about uh, B1 and about statutory analysis. I, I, I agree that a court is going to look at language and ask why'd you put the language in there if it's already covered by something else. I think here the answer, I think there's an easy answer for that, which is that you're at, why would you add um, without the benefit of hindsight? The answer would be because we want to mirror the, the Graham standard and that's the language that Graham uses. Graham says an officer in the circumstances without the benefit of hindsight. So what would be your legislative purpose? It would be to make clear that you're not seeking to deviate from Graham. That would satisfy, I think, that statutory interpretation. Uh, you know, every police agency policy you could find in the country that defines objective reasonableness will include the full sentence from Graham. But here, leaving it out raises the question is whether that was an intention, an intent to deviate from the standard. So it's true that the court uses maybe duplicative language, but I think if you're essentially paraphrasing the standard that you want to apply, I think that's a satisfactory explanation for why you're doing it. But, but I think Bryn is suggesting that it belongs, if we're going to do that, it belongs in B1. Well, I don't, yeah. well I, 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 it's a very, very subtle point, but I would point out that the Supreme Court didn't do it that way in Graham. The totality of circumstances tells you to, to identify all of the facts that were in play. But the issue about hindsight is that it is a kind of standard of review that you use. The next sentence that I didn't quote in the Graham case, you know, says, um, you know, not every push and shove uh, that seems unnecessary in the comfort of a judge's chambers uh, is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So when you're really talking about hindsight, it's about talking about kind of injecting yourself into the situation. Uh, the court uh, 
when they um, are, are describing the totality of the circumstances, they're just identifying all of those elements. Um, so, I mean, it's, I, I, for me, clarity is to follow the formulation of the standard that everyone agrees <coughs> is the standard for objective reasonableness rather than to deviate from that. Because I think that, um, you know, that, that creates questions. Why are you not paraphrasing the Graham standard? And I think what I heard today is that everybody agrees that at least with the first of the three requirements, remember it's Graham plus two, it's objective reasonableness under Graham, and then it's necessary and proportional. That's the new stuff. Um, and I, I don't wanna uh, just put those aside and focus on Graham. It seems to me that for clarity, you would try to wanna echo uh, the Graham standard. Um, you're, you're not mentioning Graham by name, but you are using some, but not all of the language that the court uses. So I just think that the question of like, what is the purpose of the language? I don't think it's, a, to me, is not a significant concern given the testimony on both sides, uh, bo both uh, houses uh, or chambers that the objective reasonable component, the first of those three requirements is the Graham standard. Um, and, and with respect to feasibility, um, you know, there are a couple of consequences aside from assessing the, the use of force that I think um, you need to take into account. For example, virtually every police department has a policy that says our officers are subject to discipline if they violate state law. So if B5 is a, is, a, is a legal obligation and it says you can do, you shall do this. The question is, and was it part of the example I gave is whether that officer violated the law or not. Um, it's not whether we're not gonna discipline you for your force, but we told you that you should take this into account and you didn't. Um, it, 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 whenever we look at a shall clause in legislation, we always ask, okay, what's the consequence if you don't meet the shell, what happens to you? And there's also a rule in, let, in negligence that if you're, su if you're being sued for negligence, if you violate a statute, um, which relates to safety, uh, either directly or indirectly, like if you violate a speed limit, you know, that, might, that might help bolster a case of negligence if you're violating a safety regulation and so forth. So, I mean, the way it's connected now, the shall, uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting, <clears throat> and I think useful uh, requirement to take into account that part of the totality that you're really concerned about is dealing with people with mental illness. And there's a good factual record for that because a lot of use of force incidents in Vermont uh, involve people who have uh, mental illness or other impairments or actually perceived. So it's, it's useful to have that. But the way it's phrased now, it, it looks like a freestanding legal duty. It doesn't say, um, it, 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 it doesn't say that in determining whether force is reasonable, you'll consider whether the officer took that into account. It doesn't say that. It just says, you have to include this in your calculus. So that was the reason why, you know, ensuring that we're only, imposing that legal duty when we all agree that it's feasible for the officer to comply with the duty made sense to us at least. Okay. Well, I'm kind of when feasible covers it. If it ain't feasible, then you when the courts are looking back at something, if they determine it wasn't feasible prior to the use of force, I mean, all right, thank you. Any other comments, questions from the committee? Oh, finally, uh, the look at the timeline. What, do you think, man, we could easily make it October 1st? Give, I mean, give, give them time to do it, whatever they need. Well, I, yeah, but I don't want them to. No, have. not forever, but I mean, it, it is a lot of people to get in there. 
do all that training. Well, I don't know when they came up with September 1st, what they expected for timeline. I don't know. October sounds good then. Better. I agree with Alice. I suspect they just weren't thinking that the Senate might have to address this bill before they <laughs> passed it. And I'm saying that with kindness for all those of you listening on YouTube. Thank you, Senator Benning. Any other questions, comments before we take the bill up again tomorrow? We're going to hear from some other witnesses. Um, um, Senator Sears, none of them have confirmed yet. Okay. Well, if we don't hear from them, we will um, uh, we make our best efforts. Um, and we will hear from them. We, we have promised to take this up again. And uh, what date would we say were? I think you said the fit was it the 15th? So, um, Etan Nazaradin could. Testify. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, think, I think it was the 15th. Um, <clears throat> tomorrow we have it from 10 15 to 12. Uh, okay. But Mark Hughes, Curtis Reed, Susanna Davis, and Skylar Nash, none of which have confirmed yet. All right. Well, we could always change the agenda, make up something else. We have, what else do you have, Bren, if we need to substitute? That in our committee, since we'd have you tomorrow at 10 um, 15. I mean, oh, sorry. 128, H 128, the um, criminal defenses based on victim identity. I think you have that scheduled for yeah. Friday. Yeah. We could um, probably take that up and then 